Hey guys, welcome back to 428 Shibuya Scramble. It's DJ Gamer Girl signing on. So, last episode, we basically got two bad endings. We fixed one, but we still got two bad endings. And just. Not just all saws thing has changed, but. There's no keep out on Minorikawa anymore. So, I wanna. I, I, I know I said I would continue doing Osa, but I. <laughs> I wanna continue doing Kano just in case there's anything that could possibly affect the other characters. Or give and give Tama a keep out. So yeah, we're doing we're continuing Kano instead. Hope you don't mind. The car moved at a glacial pace toward the crime syndicate's hangout. Stanley pounded his fists on the steering wheel in frustration. They had no sooner set out than the traffic slowed to a near standstill. Despite the occasional lurch, it never crept above a crawl. Kano stood in the passenger seat. The case was rapidly getting out of hand. Now he had to worry about the safety of both Maria and her sister Hitomi. Never mind the fact that Detective Tatano had also gone missing. There were too many unknowns, too many uncertainties. His unease was growing unbearable. Also, uh, Tatano hasn't radioed in. And, like, we can't reach him from our end either. Kuze's words kept echoing inside Kano's head. What could have caused Tatano to drop out of contact? Someone had gone after Hitomi while Kano and the others were busy trailing the attaché case. Could Tatano have been... No, it couldn't be. Kano was sure Tatano would have done whatever necessary to keep Hitomi safe. Stanley broke the long silence. What's on your mind? Still thinking about... A call from Kuze? Kano didn't answer. Look, if you're worried about that other detective, the guy couldn't even protect one girl. Stanley continued, I'm doing a really bad Shatner thing. Like, really bad. Not exactly a reigning endorsement. Don't you talk about Detective Tatano that way. I'm concerned about Hitomi Osawa. But the missing attaché case needs to come first. Stanley's expression remained stone cold. Connell flashed him a sidelong glare, then went back to staring out the window. A moment later, a flurry of motion caught in, nearby in a nearby alley caught his eye. With a start, he recognized Sasayama. His fellow detective was caught up in an altercation with a man in dark clothes. Kano sprang into action, his body moving almost before his mind registered the situation. Sasayama! Fleeing the door open, he leapt out of the car. Hey, wait! Stanley called after him. But Kano was already sprinting toward the fight. Oof! The other man knocked Sasayama onto a pile of garbage. As Sasayama struggled to get back to his feet, his opponent looked down at him with a triumphant sneer. Kano finally got a look at the man, and his eyes flashed with recognition. It was the perp who'd first taken the attaché case back at the scramble. Tariq al-Karawan. You! Kano growled. He sped like a bullet to tackle al-Karawan around the legs. But al-Karawan nimbly stepped aside. Kano's arms closed on nothing but air. At the same moment, al-Karawan Ka definitely wrapped in wrapped an arm around Kano's neck. Kano felt a vice-like pressure on his car carotid artery, which is a move known as the front choke sleeper hold, constricting the 
carotid artery stops blood flow to the brain, causing the opponent to lose consciousness, also known as the guillotine choke. Interesting. His consciousness quickly began to mm, excuse me, slip away. Oh no you don't, you bastard, he snarled. Lowering his center of gravity, he got hold of one of Al Karavan's legs and used his shoulder as a fulcrum against it. <clears throat> Despite the arm still crushing his neck, Kano managed to lift his opponent high into the air. Woof! Body slam! Wait, uh, what is that move called? I can't remember. Us. Uh, he continued the movement to heave Al Karawan up and over himself, slamming him upside down into a heap of trash. Stanley strolled up to the aftermath of the struggle. Well, got the brawn part down, he said. Need some work on the brains. Shut up. Kano's intelligence. He's just... inexperienced. Al Kanaman was sprawled out atop the mound of, of refuse. He'd been knocked out cold. Sasayama coughed and sputtered. Kano went to help him to his feet, but Stanley stepped in between them. What are you doing? Stanley asked. Helping Sasayama, what does it look like? We need to apprehend Al Kanaman first. He's not even conscious. Sasayama can come first. He pushed Stanley aside and crouched down alongside his partner. You alright? He asked. Yeah, Sasayama groaned. You bailing me out, though. Can't let the missus know about that. Mom's the word, Kano said. He slipped an arm underneath Sasayama and helped him to his feet. Uh, I managed to find the guy who had the attache case, Sasayama said. When I tried to arrest him, the fellow came out of nowhere. This fellow came out of nowhere and attacked me. And Stanley is just sitting, standing there, not sitting. He's just standing there, watching them like a moron, instead of going to apprehend Al Karawan himself. He's complaining about Kano not apprehending him. He's not apprehending him either. So up yours. He flashed Al Karo on a nasty look. So here we go again. Disobeying direct orders, Stanley huffed. What's the deal with Japanese police anyway? He shook his head in exasperation. You are really, really, really getting on my nerves. You, 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 you. He's pissing me off. This idiot. Yeah, I'm calling you the idiot. It's pissing me off. Sasayama gave Kano a puzzled look, jerking his thumb at the American. I I promise you, any foreigners who any any people outside of America watching this, not all Americans are like this guy. I mean, I'd like to think I'm not. I... I don't care about that shit. I judge on the individual, not the whole. Who's this guy? It's a long story, Kano said. He felt Sasayama in on the situation. Enough chit-chat. Hurry up and cuff this guy, Stanley said. Kano knelt down by Al Karo on his unconscious. You could have cuffed him! You are useless! Absolutely useless! Except for one moment. When we first met you, you have been freaking useless. You... Oh, cuff him. Don't, I'm not gonna cuff him. You cuff him. I'm not... You're working with the police. You're a member of Foreign Affairs. You could have cuffed him. Or tied him up. I don't care. You could have done something to make sure he was 
contained. Connell paused. Alconawan's sleeve had slid back from his wrist. What's this? The unconscious man had a tattoo of a two-headed scorpion on his left forearm. Stanley strode over. You find something? He asked. Yeah. I think this guy might be the Reen leader. Seeing the image had reminded Connell of something he'd heard back at headquarters. That the head of the foreign syndicate had a scorpion tattoo. So this guy is, so it, this is the guy in charge? He relayed this information to Stanley. Let's see. Stanley called up Kuzi on his cell. You'll be happy to know that the guy with the attache case is still at large, he said. Apprehending the Reen leader at this point shouldn't be an issue. One of your so very Capable subordinates gave us a big step forward in the case here. Wait a second. Sasayama murdered. That was sarcasm, wasn't it? Stanley hung up and called over to him. Think you can escort this guy back to the precinct? Yeah, sure. Seeing how very capable I am. <laughs> Kano felt his phone vibrate. The display showed an incoming call from Lumi. Hello? He answered warily, keeping his voice down. Stanley had him a little on edge. It's me. It was Shizua. Damn it! Connell thought. He did not have time for this right now. But if he just hung up, he might be in even deeper hot water. Kano decided to, to take that risk. He hung up the phone. Decided he better listen to what the old man had to say. Yeah, yeah listen. Listen to what the old man had to say. Please. Kano decided he better listen to what the old man had to say. Hello, sir. I'm afraid I'm not really at liberty to take a personal call right now, even if it is for my father-in-law. He did his best to sound apologetic. I'm not your father-in-law. Uh, yes, of course. Sorry, sir. He bowed his head reflexively, feeling like an idiot. You really don't give a damn about keeping me waiting like this, do you? Sir, I swear to you I feel terrible. Please, I just... Flustered, he took a deep breath and recomposed himself. I promise you, sir. I promise I'll be there. If you could just wait a little what Don't make promises you can't keep! Shijul's barking rebuke had made Kano break out in a sweat. You think I'm gonna let you off the hook just because you're working a case? This is exactly why I don't want my daughter with some detective. Great. Another angry tirade. But didn't you used to be a detective, sir? Kano muttered. You watch yourself, you little brat! It's not enough that you keep calling me your father-in-law. Now you have to bring that up? Evidently, Kano had touched a raw nerve. Very. Ever have a dentist hit a nerve while drilling a tooth? That's where this expression comes from. Ah, I've never had a drooth till- a, a, a drooth tilling. A tooth drilling. And I hope I never will. Seems like anything he said only made matters worse. Well, you're not off the hook, she's will continue. I'm never letting my daughter marry the likes of you. His fury hitting its crescendo, she's will promptly hung up. Why on earth did Shizuo hold such intense malice toward police detectives when he'd been one himself? Kano had become a detective for Rumi's sake in the first place, and now it was the biggest thing holding him back. Hey, come on, let's go. Stanley's voice snapped Kano out of his daze. Ugh. Grimly, he followed the American back to the car. As if it hasn't been stolen. Yet again, uh, Stanley was thumping the steering wheel in frustration. You are a very, very impatient man. And short-tempered. Traffic hadn't let up one bit. It was starting to look like they might never make it to the foreign syndicate's hangout. Connell caught sight of a girl in a hoodie, weaving her way between the stopped cars on foot. He rolled down the window and called out to her. Miku Morita was a fighter at the cosplay fighting pub bride, but just decided to retire after losing to Tama, the cat, in a street fight. She's thinking about what to do with herself now. Excuse me, miss. Does something happen? 
Huh? What do you mean? With the road. I mean, what's with all the traffic? Oh, right. Apparently there was some big accident over by the train station. That's probably what's causing it. Really? Yeah, I don't think you guys are going to be going anywhere for quite a while. She smiled and went on her way. Stanley gave the steering wheel another punch. Well, I guess they did say this wasn't just a um, typical ransom case, he muttered. Connell saw an opportunity. If they're not after the money, then what are they after? Stanley kept his eyes forward, acting as if he hadn't heard. Look, Connell said, I can't help you if you keep me out of the loop. After a few moments of thought, Stanley replied with a single monosyllable. Drugs. What? Maria's father, Kenji Osoa. I assume you're... aware. He works for Oko Okoshi Pharmaceutical. I am. Nothing's been made public yet. But also, I recently oversaw the development of a new drug, the antiviral. It's not at all uncommon for a new drug to be in development for 15 years or more, with expenses totaling a, a lot. 20 billion to 30 billion yen. Good lord! 20, 30 to 30 billion yen is only roughly 2 to 300 million US dollars? They're more expensive than we are. Before it is approved, worldwide demand and sensational profits can be expected if a groundbreaking medicine is developed. Nonetheless, pharmaceutical companies are often under major pressure due to the tremendous cost of labor and equipment. And someone is trying to get their hands on it. Kano's mind latched onto this new information, trying to assemble the pieces of an evolving puzzle. Someone? Who? An international criminal mastermind. This foreign syndicate is merely a tool in someone else's game. Kano regarded Stanley's face carefully. He looked more cold and serious than ever. So, wait, does that mean that the reason we're letting the syndicate walk around unfettered is on my orders? Yes. I see. So the only thing you're really concerned with is catching this international mastermind. Precisely. Kano felt like he was staring he was starting to get a picture of what sort of person Stanley was. So you don't really care what happens to the girl who's been abducted, do you? Not particularly. No. Why? Do you have a problem with that? Kano clenched his fist. His hand was shaking with anger. Dick Dictum nun number eight. When you really want to punch something, you really probably shouldn't. Kano recited the words inwardly like some sort of desperate mantra. If he didn't manage to calm himself, calm himself down, he was liable to slam his fist right into Stanley's face. No, do it! I want to see it! I want to see that happen! Outside the car, traffic remained at a standstill. Kano chaffed against a feeling of utter futility. One after another, his uncertainties came to nag at him. Was Maria still safe? What had happened to Hitomi and Tatano, her bodyguard? And now, on top of all this, it struck Kano as really rather careless to send Sasayama away without Karawan, without any backup, now that Jack had alerted him to the presence of a dangerous international mastermind still on the loose. Fighting back his fit of pique, Kano got off his cell phone. To do something impulsively out of irritation, resentment, or the like. Similar to doing something in a huff. He dialed up Sasayama. He dialed up Detective Kajiwara, who was stationed at the Osoa residence. He hoped a little more information about the family's two daughters might shed some light on the situation. The detective answered promptly. 
And that beeper is still going off. Got you out of here. Hey, it's Kano. Hmm? Kano? A horrid jarring beeping was audible from the other end of the line. What's that noise? Kano asked. Sorry, oh, hold on, I can't really hear you. Okay, go on. It sounded like Kajiwara had moved away from the source of the noise, though Kano could still hear it faintly in the background. He explained I was looking for more information on the also girls. Honestly, Detective Kano, I thought you were more mature than this, Kajiwara said disapprovingly. Come again? Kano said bewildered. What's with the attitude all of a sudden? You've got a little crush, don't you? Kajiwara told him. What? No, Detective, that isn't why. You mustn't let yourself get personally attached to an investigation. Still, I was on an impulsive once, myself once. I guess I can tell you one thing. Kano kept his cell phone pressed tight against his ear. The two girls, they look exactly alike. Ka uh, 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 we know that. Kajiwara kept his voice low as if he were revealing a major secret. But Kano knew this already. Everyone assigned to the investigation had been informed that the girls were twins at, at the previous night's briefing. However, Kajiwara continued still sotto voce. Their personalities are pretty different. The younger sister Hitomi is quiet and reserved, but Ma Maria is apparently more of a busybody. Ah, I see. Kano thought back on Hitomi standing in front of the statue of Pachiko. She had indeed, seem, indeed seemed like an introvert, though Kano had also sensed her intense commitment to helping her sister. Perhaps she was less demonstrative, but her heart certainly seemed to be in the right place. Kano heard someone shouting in the background wherever Kajiwara was. Uh, well, what was that just now? He asked. Mr. Osawa, the girl's father. I think something might have happened. Kajiwara's voice was laced with concern. I should go see wh what this is all about. Yeah, probably. But Kano, tell me. Yes? Which one is it? Which one do you have a crush on? Kano hung up. Yeah, see to Osawa! And long last, traffic began to move again. Almost as soon as it did, however, Stanley had to slam on the brakes. The abrupt stop made Kano smack his head against the windshield. Hey, what gives? Look, Stanley said. He gestured with his chin. Kano couldn't believe his eyes. There, walking on the, along the sidewalk, was Al Karawan. Very much not in custody. What the hell? Kano shouted, already ho hopping out of the car. Stanley was right behind him. They crept up on their target as silently as possible, then rushed him once they were close. Why does it keep going dark like this? In a moment, they had subdued him. Kano used his own body weight to hold Al Karawan down. What are you doing here? He demanded. I, I don't understand why the it's why the picture is doing that. Oh hey, guess you didn't get the memo, huh? Al Karawan flashed a quite grin. Oh, so you do talk. They let me go. Let you go? I think your buddy here might have problems, Al Karawan said to Stanley. I'm a free man. Kano turned and glared at Stanley. What's he talking about? No idea. Why does it keep going dark like this? Seriously. First things first. Get this guy back to the precinct. Oh, uh, to the syndicate. Hang out myself. You don't think this is weird? Kano asked. I mean, what the heck is this guy doing on the loose again? What matters is that he is free. Maybe he's telling the truth about being let go. But that's ridiculous! Then I guess he must have escaped on his own. Stanley replied. In either case... Your buddy screwed up royally. Now it's on you to unscrew things. None of this sat right with Kano, but the fact remained that he couldn't just let Al Karawan go. He gave Stanley detailed directions to hang out, and the car sped away towards Yoyogi. 
Then Kano headed back to the precinct with his captive, trying to reassure himself that he might learn something from questioning Al Karawan. That would help resolve the case. Yeah, he seems a bit... I don't know. Non-cooperative? Kano said, sat opposite Al Karawan in the interrogation room. He'd been attempting to interview the suspect for about a quarter of an hour. Al Karawan sat ramrod stiff, not responding to any prompts or questions. What time is it right now? He asked. They'd taken away his watch, his wallet, a small knife, and his keychain. This was the third time he asked how to, he asked to know the time. Why are you so concerned what time it is? Kano asked. Al Karawan gave no reply. You waiting on something? Again, the suspect was staunchly silent. Kano wasn't sure what to make of this, but he took a look at his watch. It's around 2 o'clock, he said. What time exactly? It's 2.18. 2.18. And how many seconds? Look, just cut the crap! Why is it going dark like that? Wasn't doing this before! Kano grabbed the prisoner by the collar. What the hell are you people after? Aokarawan merely repeated his question. What time is it right now? With a growl of aggravation, Kano shoved his wristwatch in Aokarawan's face. Ah, oh, it's 2.20. Al Karawan said. Okay then, I should do it. What? What does that mean? The interrogation went on for several more hours. Despite Connell's best efforts, however, Al Karawan said nothing more. During all that time, the case continued to develop in unexpected ways. But Connell, stuck in the interrogation room, knew nothing about it until everything was already over and done. Someone can do something at 1340 to throw a wrench into Kano's activities. Boy, you guys really want Kano to... To, 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 to not get anything done. <laughs> All of a sudden, a different noise cut in over the bug tracker. Kajiwata here. Hmm? Kano. Kajiwata's customary nonchalant expression vanished into a sudden seriousness. Sorry, hold on, he continued. I can't really hear you. He headed out of the room, the phone clutched to his ear. Also, I was left to wonder what the detective had been about to tell him. The bug tracker was... Was what? What the heck was going on? The sound wasn't stopping. Decided that he better do something. Also, I took the bug tracker and checked behind the bookcase. D d it didn't seem like the signal was coming from back there. He proceeded to pull each and every one of the books off the shelf. Nothing. He checked the area around his computer. He scanned the monitor, the case, the power outlet. But he found nothing that could be a listening device anywhere. Is this a bad end? Kano gonna go insane. Not Kano. Also, uh... He found a screwdriver and dismantled the mouse, which is a Logitech. Cool. The brown circuit board was lined with chips, but nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary. And still, the mechanical sound continued, mocking him. He just tried to find it. Go ahead. Look everywhere. He was being ridiculed. The sound just wouldn't stop. And the time still and still the time ticked past. Had it been five minutes? Ten? Maybe more? He began to lose hope that he could find the listening device and even to stop caring. Instead, he was overcome with the feeling that this room, which for years had been a sanctuary, had ceased to be his own. It was it was as if something other had intruded and laid claim to his personal space. In his fevered mind, he began to hear the tracker's sound as a high-pitched laugh. 
an accursed, relentless noise, cruel and taunting. The mockery of the devil himself. Also, I hurled the bug tracker against the wall. Then he picked it up, only to smash it back onto the floor. Then he stomped on it ferociously. There was a satisfying snap, accompanied by the sensation of the thing being crushed underfoot. The noise stopped. Or, well, it ought to have. And yet, for some reason, the horror noise kept sounding in also his ears. It wasn't coming from the bug tracker after all. It was inside his own head, somewhere, inescapable, echoing within his skull. No, the noise didn't stop. It only grew louder. Why? 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 Also, a screamed. Why? Why was he being tormented like this? He couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't even think straight anymore. He felt his mind beginning to dissolve. This is another bad ending. Uh, that's... that's my bad. Yeah, the call distracted him. Alright, 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 let's uh... Let's... let's... Let's call Sasayama instead of Kajiwara. He dialed up Sasayama. He wanted to make sure his partner had gotten Alkadawan back to the precinct safely. Sasayama picked up almost right away. Kano, what's up? How are things on your end? Any problems getting Alkadawan back? Nah, I've got Tatano taking care of him. Wait, what? Kano could hardly believe his ears. You were in touch with Tatano? He asked. He could hear the shock in his own voice. Yeah. Just bumped into him over by the precinct a little while ago. Then he is safe? Kano felt a surge of relief. What about Hitomi then? Stanley glanced over at him, curious. Tatano says he lost track of her somehow. And then he got called back to the precinct, apparently. Tatano had lost track of her? That's not like him, Kano thought. Since he was heading back there anyway, I handed the, our guy over to him, Sasayama said. I see. Kano was glad to hear that Tatano was alright, but his relief was tempered by a surge of anger at the thought of what had happened to Hitomi. Now I'm back to tailing the attaché case, Sasayama continued. Today's my wife's birthday, you know. My plan is to wrap up this thing ASAP so we can celebrate tonight. I've already got a present and everything. I envy you, man. Closing his eyes, Kano took a moment to picture Rumi. But Shizuo's face popped into his mind's eye right alongside her. Well, just hang in there, buddy. Even if your girlfriend is just a picture of Masami Nagahama. Yeah. <laughs> Still snickering, Sasayama hung up. Kano bit his lip and slipped his phone back into his pocket. At long last, traffic began to move again. <sighs> yeah, and then Al Karawan. Okay, so... Yeah, now we're back to the keep out. Um... Is Achi still bad end? Oh, something's different! Oh! Hitomi chirped. That's me! She took a look at the LCD display. It's an email from Mr. Tanaka. Oh, okay. Hitomi began typing out a response with practice D's. More wild delusions rose in Achi's mind. I mean... Stealing a quick glance at Hitomi, he noticed her gazing happily at her phone screen. His delusions ran even more wild.
While he was still fretting furiously, Hitomi finished typing the response. So... Uh... What did she wind up saying? Ashi asked. I explained the situation. That we're trapped in a storeroom. You've got some... You've got some guys chasing after you. That we're trapped in a storeroom. You've got some guys chasing after you and you're looking for some van? Yeah. I also asked him to please keep this a secret from my family and the police. Whoever this Tanaka guy was, he took sure seemed to put a lot of trust in him. A short while later, Hitomi's phone chimed with a reply. She checked the screen in a flash, all eager, all eagerness. Achi couldn't help but ask, and did his utmost to pretend he didn't notice. I mean, it's kind of rude, so... Mr. Tanaka says he's going to look for the minivan for us. Huh? He says he wants us to hide out here a little longer. What? No. If he just comes and lets us out, I can go look for the van myself. He said that if someone's after me, it's safer to stay where we are. Yeah, I'm out of the running, Achi thought to himself. This Tanaka was clearly pretty concerned for her. And there was really only one reason a middle-aged man would think like that. All right. Fine, we'll wait. Achi turned his own phone off and then slumped back in a huff. After 20 more minutes in the storeroom, the two were sitting in silence. Achi had run out of things to talk about. Do you think you'll ever be friends again? You and. Ah, oh, that's he to me talking. Um, you and that one guy. Susumo, I think it was? Hitomi's question caught Achi off guard. He stammered, unsure how to respond. Hitomi shook her head. I'm so sorry. I barely know you. That was insensitive of me. Nah, it's alright. I mean, sometimes I wish things could go back to the way they used to be, Achi said. He let out a tiny sigh. What that Kiryu guy said was the truth. I... I was the guy who founded SOS. Do you, uh, you know what I mean by that? Itumi gave a slight nod. I mean, I never wanted to be in charge of a gang or anything, but I knew that if I left, SOS would just fall apart. And I didn't want everyone else to get all caught up over who would take my place, you know? So I thought long and hard about it. Looking for a way for folks to stay friends even after I was gone. Alright, I'm going to end the episode here. Next episode will continue from this point. Till then, this is the Gamer Girl, signing off. Bye-bye.